Okay, it seems pretty steady, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, my name is Valerie Vergona. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Peconic Estuary Partnership. And this is a great webinar we have today. Uh, this is the annual River Herring and Eel Survey Training in conjunction with the Community Science Long Island webinar series. So to introduce those two programs, Community Science Long Island, or CSLI, is an annual educational webinar series that highlights various community science opportunities around Long Island and also highlights the importance of these projects in supporting local wildlife conservation efforts. CSLI is hosted by CTUC, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, and the South Shore Estuary Reserve. And the annual Long Island River Herring and Eel Survey is one of Long Island's longest running community science projects. Started in 2006, the survey engages community volunteer scientists to monitor runs of migratory river herring and American eels in rivers and streams across Long Island. The survey, organized by CTUC and partners at Long Island Sound Study, Peconic Estuary Partnership, and South Shore Estuary Reserve, aims to find waterways where remnant runs of river herring still exist and then to monitor the size of these runs and hopefully to help them and open up spawning uh, territory for those river herring. Our main presentation today on, river, on the river herring and eel survey will be given by Enrico Nardone, Executive Director of SeaTuck Environmental Association. We will then hear from Caitlin Matei, and I'm sorry y'all if I am butchering anybody's last names, uh, and Caitlin is the Conservation Project Manager for SeaTuck Environmental Association. Uh, Caitlin will be telling us how to use the Survey123 app in order to uh, log sightings of river herring. Our breakout groups will be led as follows. Uh, for the North Shore, uh, we have the North Shore, Long Island Sound, and Westchester area will be presented by Jimena Perez. This, uh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your last name as well. This, this salus, uh, you're going to have to do it for me. <laughs> it's Casillas. Yes, I would have never. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Jimena is the outreach coordinator for the Long Island Sound Study, uh, specifically the Nassau Suffolk County region. And Lily Genovese is the outreach coordinator for the New York City and Westchester County um, Long Island Sound Study Program. The South Shore Breakout Group will be led by Sally Kellogg. Program Implement Implementation Specialist for the New York State Department of State and Reserve Office, as well as Enrico Nardone, once again, of SeaTuck. And the East End Sites will be led by myself, uh, Pete Topping, who is Executive Director and Baykeeper of Peconic Baykeeper, and Byron Young, retired uh, New York State DEC fisheries biologist and a local diagnosis fish savior here on Long Island. Uh, we're also joined and helped by Ariel Santos, conservation scientist for SeaTuck. So before we go ahead into the main presentation and get started, uh, this webinar will be recorded. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. Uh, we will answer questions after the main presentation and then again uh, during breakout groups if you have any questions about the app as well as those breakout uh, sites. Uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Enrico, you can go ahead and take it away. And Enrico, you are just muted for when you want to begin. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us, folks. It's always uh, uh, exciting for me to kind of do this talk and and um, get to the get to the river herring and eels part of the season because it feels like it's one of the first kickoffs of spring. I know it seems like a long way off, but it's nice to know that these fish are already. Uh, gathering offshore and, and moving in our directions with the hope of spring spring on the way. 
Um, um, I, I'm going to go through some basic uh, background on the, the species that we're focused on, river herring and American eel, and then go through the sort of the sort of why we do this survey every year and the basics of how to participate. And then I'll turn it over to Katie for some details on the technical side of how you can um, enter your data. Um, we're going to save questions till the end, but we will have a Q&A session when I'm done before we get to Katie. And uh, I'm I'm pleased that there's some other, there's some great expertise on this call. So we'll have Byron Young and others to, to chime in to correct me when I, if and when I mess anything up. All right, so um, I always like to start with this great map that Brett Bennington at Hofstra University made. It's a digital elevation map of Long Island, and it shows sort of the detail of all these um, these streams that you know sort of result from the glacial history of Long Island. Uh, this huge outwash plain that formed uh, downstream from the glaciers, you, you know, stretched for fifty or hundred miles. Um, at one time, but as sea levels rose, um, it's just sort of shrunk down to its current day state. But as that as that outwash plain was there, runoff from the glaciers was carving through it and creating all these um, small valleys. And those small valleys still exist. They're essentially where our streams are, as as the sea level and groundwater rose to fill them over time. So we have a lot of them, more than 140. Uh, streams and rivers in Nassau and Suffolk County. Um, so it's a, a rich um, geological history that's given us all these great waterways. Uh, they're mostly small, as, as you know, and, and many places you can you know hop over them or easily wade through them. Uh, they're all groundwater fed and um, you know mostly cold water and, and places where they're free flowing. Um, important part of the terrestrial landscape of Long Island, of course, but also a really important um, part of the connection between the uplands and the estuaries and the ocean. And uh, where they allow, they, they transport wildlife, um, sediment, energy back and forth between these habitats and are really the connecting piece between the uplands on Long Island and our coastal ecosystem. And um, a very important part of that connection are the are the fish that move back and forth um, and up and down these streams. And we'll get to that. But these sort of I like to start with this Greek lesson. Um, this is the these fish that move between freshwater and saltwater are called diadromous fish. This root of this word is running. The prefix di means through. So these are fish that split their life cycle between saltwater and freshwater. And so there's two categories of diadromy, um, anadromous and catadromous. Uh, the first is fish that spend most of their lives at stream at sea. These are up up running fish. They live at sea and move upstream to spawn. And you all know the most famous of these fish. This is the fish from the Discovery Channel jumping up waterfalls and past grizzly bears. This is the Pacific salmon. Uh, we don't have any Pacific salmon here, of course, uh, and no Atlantic salmon on Long Island. Uh, they're mostly further north where they still exist. Um, but we do have some other uh, anadromous fish in the neighborhood, Atlantic sturgeon going up the Hudson, uh, American shad and striped bass. Uh, these are all fish that spawn in freshwater and but are mostly known as ocean bearing fish. Uh, none of these fish, however, uh, existed on Long Island primarily because they're big fish and our rivers and streams are just too small to support them. Uh, so our anadromous fish are river herring. And when I say river herring, uh, that's not a species name, that's a category that includes two fish. Uh, one is the alewife and the other is the blueback herring. Um, they're, they're very similar, but not, not the same. And in this picture, they're very easy to distinguish. You got the, the blueback herring on the bottom with the blue, bluish um, scales on the top. Um, but in, in real life, they're not so easy to distinguish. And um, it, it, even to experienced field biologists, uh, you know, it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. And, and really one of the, the clearest way to tell them apart requires cutting them open to see the lining of their gut, which is a different color in, in the two species. Um, so for our purposes, we just group these together. Um, most of our fish, as far as we know, are alewives, 
but blueback herring are um, are potentially um, uh, mixed in. Certainly, we're here at one time, so we don't ask anybody to be involved in the survey to try to make this distinction. We group them all as just river herring. Uh, these are ocean faring fish, as I said, in large schools, uh, often mixed schools offshore, um, on the continental shelf there in light blue, in depths of up to sort of two, three hundred feet. They um, they they move up and down the up and down the coastline. Uh, alewives uh, further north, up into Canada, um, blueback herring a little bit further south. Their range extends, but their ranges overlap and they they share space and potentially are together in mixed schools anyway. Um, they move into our estuaries in the winter, like they're already coming in now in, into uh, nearshore habitats. And then when the time is right, they run upstream to spawn. I have time in quotes there because, of course, it has nothing to do with the calendar. It has all to do with temperature. Uh, they're waiting for the temperature of the of the outflowing water from the, the rivers and streams to sort of start approaching 50 degrees. So somewhere in that you know, mid to high 40s is what is is the right time for these fish to move upstream. And we, you know, we have learned over the years from great research from Kelly McCartan and others um, that they don't just move in, spawn, and move out. There's a lot of pulsing that happens. They can move in. There could be a cold snap. They'll move back down and come in again uh, over the course of several weeks. So um, it's not just like the flip the switch and they move. And um, the other thing is this temperature switch doesn't happen at the same time everywhere. We tend to see the run start on the east end of Long Island and, and then work its way uh, west. So we often get the first reports um, of, of fish uh, from people that are on this call, Byron Young, Pete Topping from sites out on the east end like the Peconic River. So these fish then move upstream and they they they're trying to get to fresh water. They'll go up as far upstream as they can, and and maybe sometimes in suboptimal brackish conditions will spawn. But they're gathering in groups. They're trying to sort of be around each other to spawn. And this is sort of what they look like underwater at the Mill River and Rockville Center. You'll notice they all are about the same size. This is sort of the you know sort of eleven twelve inches. They sometimes can get as big as maybe fourteen or fifteen inches, but they're very uniform looking in size and shape. Um, these are all adults. By the time they come in to spawn, they're you know sort of three, four, five years at least, uh, can live to 10 or 12 years. Um, they're you know, very forked tail, um, silver and shiny. Uh, and that spot on the behind the gill covers, just sort of about the same height as their eyes, sort of diagnostic. You can recognize that spot um, even from out of the water. This is another side of them from above and this is actually Sunken Meadow Creek, but they're gonna they're gathering, they're trying to get to calm sort of flat water like this we call it. And uh, this is sort of their this is their spawning behavior. They're not nest builders. they're circling around each other, uh, dispersing into the water column. and so they're, they're sort of milling about, you might say, is sort of their characteristic um, activity. Each female can lay up to a quarter million eggs. Those eggs hatch into these super cute little juvenile alewives, which then um, will stay in the streams for a while, but usually moving out with, with high flows, uh, storm events uh, into the estuary. Um, where they sort of sort of linger for a while, but by the time they're about uh, three inches long over the course of the first year, they're moving back out to the ocean and rejoining those offshore uh, schools. Um, well, they'll they'll stay for sort of three to five years before, as mature adults, they make their first run back. Uh, they do have some site fidelity, so they're trying to go back to the streams where they hatched. Uh, that's not, they're not always exactly precise with that. They can stray, it's called, uh, you know, east or west and, and get to a nearby stream, but they are trying to get back home, so to speak. Uh, so those, again, those are anadromous fish that I covered. Those are fish living in, in, in the ocean and moving into fresh water. The other category of diadromy is fish that are 
mostly living in freshwater and going out to the ocean to breed uh, or to spawn. These are, um, this is a much smaller category. And I should have mentioned in the beginning when I, th this idea of diadromous fish that can go between saltwater and freshwater, there's like 32,000 species of fish in the world. And only about a hundred of them are diadromous. I mean, it's a really unique uh, uh, trait that they can, it's, it's, it's sort of a defies um, science really in chemistry, the ability to move back and forth. Um, generally you take a freshwater fish and put it in salt water, it dies and vice versa. But the fact that these fish can do it is pretty amazing. Um, so back to these catadromous fish that are fish again, mostly in the rivers, but move out to the ocean um, for their reproductive stage. So they're down running, uh, mostly in freshwater and migrate to the sea. Our only catadromous fish is the American eel. I can give a long talk on this because they're just amazing, amazing fish, but I'm going to quickly uh, go through their life cycle. All American eels are hatched in the middle of the North Atlantic, this area called the Sargasso Sea, which is the only sea in the world not bounded by land. Um, it is, I used to think of it as just a small place, but it's three times as big as the Mediterranean to give you an idea. It sort of exists between these major ocean currents. Um, and these American eels going there, the fact that they go there has only been known to science for about 10 years. Uh, they only confirmed it six or seven years ago when they were able to tag a fish that went there. Um, but they've never seen an American eel in the Sargasso Sea. As an adult, they've never witnessed the, the spawning behavior. Uh, they just, they know that they're there because it's the place in the ocean where they find the smallest and most abundant uh, larval uh, American eels. Um, and the, the other amazing thing is that the Sargasso Sea is also the place where all European eels are, are hatched. Um, and you might think that they're, well, they're the same species. They just, some go east to Europe and others go west to, the, to North America, but um, it's not true. They've determined that they are totally, they're actually separate species. Um, they all start their movement from the Sargasso by going sort of east and north on the, on the, on the Gulf Stream. And, and the American eels sort of just get off the roller, off the, uh, the merry-go-round earlier by moving, moving west towards North America. The European eels stay on the merry-go-round and go all the way around across the North Atlantic and end up in Europe. Um, so scientists don't really know how that all happens and how they figure it out, but, but they do. Um, when they hatch, they're this like willow-like shape. They don't have, they don't look like eels necessarily. They don't really swim. They're just planktonic and floating on currents. Um, but eventually the American eels, as they get over, this is what they, they look like. They have no pigment. They're totally clear. Um, but as they move over the continental shelf, they transform into that eel shape and then they move into the estuaries and then move into a river or stream again. Now they're not trying to get home like the eels are because they've never been there before. So they're just trying to find a place to get to fresh water. And when they move into our streams, they're still translucent and they, they're called, we call them glass eels at this point. And this is what they look like when they're coming into the systems. This is in uh, Bayshore and Panatica Creek. You can see the density when they come together, they, they can be a lot at one time. And as they're in fresh water, they start to gain pigment. So eventually, um, this is in Massapequa, eventually they start to look like darker eels. And when they, once they've fully gained pigment and they're darker, we, they're called elvers. So here is actually a mix of, of glass eels and elvers together. Um, and then this is a video from the Mill River. This is a, just to give you an idea of how many of these things, when they come together at the right time, how many, this sort of sometimes amazing densities they can gather in. This is a lot of eels. This, this, is, the, this is by far the most I've ever encountered at one place. That's about how big they are. This is their original range. They were in every 
stream and river in North America, the entire Mississippi system, all the way through Central and into South America. Um, they Once they're in freshwater, they stay for a decade or sometimes 20 years or more, and they grow to be you know, three, four, even four, five feet long. At some point, they when, once they reach maturity, they're considered yellow eels after they're in the system for a while, but then, then they spend most of their lives that decade or two as yellow eels. But at some point, they go through this transform, their final transformation into silver eels, where they lose the yellow color, they get darker like that, their eyes get bigger, their fins grow as they get ready for their final journey back out to the ocean where they swim uh, thousands of miles, somehow navigating back to the Sargasso Sea and somehow finding all the other eels in this place three times the size of the Mediterranean uh, and they spawn and, and then die. And uh, it's really one of the one of the most amazing fish stories uh, in the world, I think, and still still a sort of marvel to science. So why are these fish important? Why do we care about them? Well, it's part of it is because they're they're um, they're feeding lots of other things, and they're helping to move ocean derived energy into and out of our um, estuaries and into our rivers and streams. So when they're in the ocean, big um, ocean bearing predators are preying on these species. Uh, in the estuaries, then there's a whole other suite of predators taking advantage of them from marine mammals to fish to birds. Uh, when they move into rivers and streams, now there's, you know, a whole new team of predators waiting to eat them. And I'm really here talking about the adults, the eels as they move back and forth, as they move out of the, into the ocean and the river herring as they move in uh, are feeding these predators. But um, I mentioned that the river herring can lay, you know, hundreds of thousands of eggs. So you think about all those little packets of energy, uh, sort of ocean derived energy that are just feeding lots of other small invertebrates and birds and fish and other things. Um, this is a bird that's named the herring gull. It's, uh, I don't think any, any mystery why it's called the herring gull. These birds can line up sometimes uh, feeding on them, these fish as they move into the rivers. Um, osprey, uh, as they, you know, their movement north uh, from their wintering grounds uh, is sort of timed as with these fish as these fish start to move in, uh, starting in the south as waters are warming. Uh, the osprey's migration is really coincides with the river herring runs because this is a fish that they rely on early in the season before some of the bunker and other um, offshore fish move move uh, further inland and they can access them. Uh, how are these fish doing? Well, in the case of the this you know this sort of sad frowning river herring here shows like these they're not doing great and part of the problem there's sort of two issues is and this this relates to all diadromous fish that, that split their lives between different places they need to rely on habitats in, in different places so they just they deal with a lot of different threats and one of the big threats that especially river herring are facing is offshore fishing and they're not targeted because they're not really a species that we we eat but they're again i mentioned that they swim in mixed schools so they're often mixed in with with atlantic herring um and um mackerel and they just get caught up in these nets and when i talk about offshore fishing i, I like to show these pictures because i'm not you might picture like well the guy with the yellow raincoat and his boat catching fish or the mom and pop fishing operations but modern offshore fishing looks like this. This is, you know, these 200 foot boats dragging these huge nets that are football fields across, uh, scooping up every and anything they can they can catch and dragging them around for, for hours and hours. So, you know, nothing survives that process. So everything that comes in is is there's no there's no returning fish from these nets, uh, letting them swim away. These everything gets uh, it's, it's like a full mortality. And then their other problem they're facing on the freshwater side is just access to the habitat they need. And that's in, uh, that's in, in the form of dams, essentially. Uh, these are not uh, jumping fish like uh, salmon. Uh, so these dams, even our low head two, three foot dams might as well be the Glen Canyon Dam because they have no chance of getting past them. Uh, 
this is some video from um, a stream in Baldwin. And just to give you an idea of like, that's about a, I don't know, 16 or 18 inch jump. And just to give an idea of how much these fish want to go upstream, but that it's too much for them. I always find that a little sad to watch, but it's motivational at the same time. Is it's sort of what, what, why we're doing this and trying to help these fish get to where they need to. Um, eels, you might have heard that they can climb walls, and there is some truth to that. If you look carefully in this video, these are glass eels climbing up a wall in Massapequa. Um, you can see a lot of them on the bottom of the wall there, maybe not as many on the top because it's hard for them. It's they're not, you know, they can like snakes. If they have two points, they can kind of grip and and climb, but it's most of them fall down if you if you sit and watch long enough, and I have, and they they can make it for a while, but they mostly fall. Some get by certainly, but the vast majority cannot get past um, our dams. Why do we have so many dams? The um, dams were were useful. They were they were powering grist mills and sawmills. Um, there was a big cranberry. Uh, industry here on Long Island one time. Ice harvesting was a necessary way to keep things cold here before refrigeration. So we built a lot of dams that are not really um, serving those purposes anymore. And um, what we're trying to do is get fish past these dams now. So this is the first permanent fishway ever installed on Long Island. This is on the Carmen's River at the Hards Lake Dam at South Haven County Park. Um, this is a structure that uh, allows the fish to swim up to up past the dam. There's a series of baffles inside of that um, structure. Like here, this is at Argyle Lake on the Carls River in, in Babylon Village. You can see inside there the baffles that just slow down the water and create places for the fish to swim. Um, as you saw there, and when they're trying to go up that wall, they're very powerful swimmers. They have a very uh, high, what scientists call a burst rate uh, that they can maintain for a while, um, but they're not jumpers. They have to be in the water. So that's what these ladders do is create uh, a column of, of water that's slow enough for them that they can they can swim through it. Um, this is a scene that's not from Long Island, but one that we're trying to bring to Long Island. In the end, the fish ladders are 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 great, and they've 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 been successful in some cases in in. Uh, helping us build populations of river herring uh, and eels. We've built some eel-only passes, but uh, in the end, they're, they're not as successful as, as restoring natural river flows and allowing these fish, and, and not just fish, but all other wildlife species that want to move up and down the rivers uh, to do that. So uh, again, we, we're not harvesting ice um, or powering grist mills with our dams anymore. Um, certainly, there are dams that can't be removed in places uh, where people have lots of homes around them, but there's plenty of dams on Long Island that we can start uh, to move past the um, legacy and, and restore free-flowing rivers. Um, SeaTalk has been working with many of our partners uh, around the island to try to try to do just that and uh, reconnect rivers and, rivers and streams with fishways and um, and hopefully someday dam removals. Uh, we've uh, published a, a strategy document identifying the, the places we think are most appropriate to be doing that. Um, and we have made some good progress over the years. We have a map. We've identified uh, all the 140 or so rivers and streams in Nassau and Suffolk counties, identified in green where the fish have access, in red where dams prevent them from getting to. And then the places that are marked here with those those cute little fish icons are the sites where we already have found uh, what we call remnant runs of these fish. So um, then most of those have been found through this, this annual survey. Um, the survey started in, as soon as, uh, as I said, uh, Fowler said 2006, when the Long Island Diadromous Fish Work Group was, was first founded. Um, I think when we started, there were, I don't know, six or seven streams where we knew these remnant runs existed through this annual surveys with great volunteers. Uh, we've pushed that number up towards um, past two dozen now. 
So um, it's it's really been, as Valerie said, one of the uh, longest running and most successful um, community science projects on Long Island. So moving into the survey details, like why are we doing this? Um, our basic goals are to um, just, again, identify where these runs exist. So even in places where there's dams built and the fish can't get as upstream as far as they want to, uh, and it may not be um, pure fresh water that they're accessing, it might just be brackish water, but usually um, good enough conditions where they can still try to spawn at the base of the dam. And they do that, it's not ideal, it's sort of suboptimal conditions, and their spawning success rate might be dropping slowly over time, but they're, they're still coming in, they're still trying to spawn, and they're hanging on uh, in sort of what we, again, refer to as these remnant runs. So we're trying to find where those remnant runs are um, and then figure out uh, how far upstream they're going, so the reach of those runs, uh, some sense about the timing of when those runs are happening, and then trying to estimate the size, uh, which is a hard thing to do. SeaTac uh, and other partners, the estuary programs are involved in, in efforts with cameras and other equipment to try to more accurately uh, assess the, the size. But, but we do ask the volunteers to at least try to um, get a sense of at least a guess of is it, is it dozens or hundreds of, or thousands of fish? Um, our 2024 goals are, as, as they've always been, is are there remnant runs that we don't know about? Are there still places where these fish are coming in to spawn and we haven't found them yet? So then that you might think, well, you've been doing this for 20 years that there's, you've found them all already, but we, we are still um, almost, at, well, not the past few years because the runs, have, the totals have been down, but we, there's been a lot of runs discovered just in the past five or and 10 years, certainly. So you would be surprised the places we haven't gotten to yet. And then are there any left? I mean, this has been the story of the past few years. Um, the, the runs where we have identified fish in the past, uh, in some cases are just uh, dwindling and, and places where we've had thousands of fish, we're down to hundreds. Places where we had hundreds, we're down to dozens. And some we have not been able to, to, to sort of document um, runs in, in the past couple of years. That, you know, there's, I, we don't know exactly what's going on, but there's some um, sense that it, it relates to this offshore fishing I mentioned. And these runs are just really being hit hard offshore. And we're, we're seeing um, the results of that. Um, you know, you might say, well, you have a few hundred fish one year and then you have a few dozen fish the next, that's not really a big change. And maybe it's, you know, it's, it's, there's something else and it's, or it's just an anomaly or it's just a blip. Um, th that's true on Long Island, but in places like Connecticut, where they've been monitoring runs for a long time and have bigger uh, rivers and therefore bigger runs, they're seeing uh, places where they have hundreds of thousands of fish for, you know, for decades. Uh, now, now reporting you know tens of thousands of fish. So it's not just Long Island; it's been all through the Mid Atlantic, and so we're that's another big focus this year is to really just figure out where, even in places where we had fish in the past, are they still there? Um, in places where fish passage has been installed, we there's still places where we've put ladders in, and we don't know that these they're being used or being used in, in by any significant amount of fish. Um, places like Argyle Lake that I mentioned on the Carls River in Babylon, we have documented with cameras that fish have used that ladder since it was installed in 2013, but we don't know um, for sure that there, that many are getting up and we have never had any documentation of fish beyond Argyle Lake. So um, that's that's a good example. Uh, where to survey, generally where fish passage is first restricted or blocked as they're coming upstream, um, where the water is clear and calm, obviously if there's lots of turbulence, they're hard to see, and the shallower the water, the, you know, the, the easier it is to see the fish because they're going to be more squeezed in the water column so you can um, see them near the surface. 
And generally, our surveying sites are at the first impassable barrier. So that a bridge or um, a spillway just over, just below that that barrier, that which is a dam in almost every case. And again, these fish are trying to go upstream as far as they can. So when they hit that barrier, that's where they stop, and that's where they're going to congregate. Uh, when to survey, uh, you know, as much surveying as you can do, we're, we're thrilled to have you out there. It'd be great if you can try to get out twice a week. Um, you know, whenever visibility is good, you, you know, if it's, if it's really, really low light or it's been raining, so the water's muddy, you're just not going to be able to see. Um, but if there's good visibility, um, and it's great then to vary the times of day and the tidal cycles, so you're just getting just more information about when these fish might be coming in. Uh, we have documented in several situations on Long Island where these are these are nocturnal movements. Uh, primarily, I, we think because there's high predation from visual predators that are just not as much of a threat at night. So fish have learned to sort of base their runs ar around that. So they are, you'll see no activity at, uh, during the day, but the fish are moving at night and at night tends to be sort of just after uh dusk and right before dawn um, so if you can do it safely perhaps with company getting out to check some sites at night is a good idea and then the only real protocol we ask is that you just stay at a site for 15 minutes and you say why 15 minutes if i go and i don't see anything why do i need to stay so much longer uh, and the, the answer is that it just takes a while sometimes to move around a bit to find the right angle with the sunlight and the right um, spot to look and just give your eyes a chance to adjust and the example i always give is having been at a, a site where we didn't know the fish existed once with my daughter who was seven or eight at the time and i was looking at some um, some carp in this spillway and i i gave her my polarized glasses because she didn't see them at first and she looked at them and said, oh, I see the, the big fish and, and I see lots of little ones too. And I grabbed the glasses back and I looked and, and sure enough, there were, these, there were dozens of river herring in this pool that I just, I just overlooked because I just hadn't really focused the right way and paid enough attention because I was seeing these other you know, bigger fish. So it, it does sometimes take, take some time to really look carefully. Other considerations, just this is not a get in the water survey. You don't need waders or anything. We want you on dry ground uh, looking into the stream. So being safe by strength, staying dry. I mentioned polarized glasses. If you have them or can access to them, they do really help sometimes cut the glare to look into the water. Um, and then river herring are cryptic. I mean, they're designed uh, not to be seen and um, to beware of imposters. Cryptic means that they're that these are just animals that are um, designed to be camouflaged in their environment. So this image, there are river herring in this image, in some cases hard to see. Um, but you can see on the on the right where there's there's darker sediment, almost impossible to see. Uh, more on the left where there's some lighter sandy spots, you can see the fish more easily. So they're dark on top to be covered, to be sort of uh, invisible against a dark background. So they are easier to see over light backgrounds, be some underwater growth like this. It's a good good spot to watch. And be wearing of imposters is, uh, this is a brook trout uh, next to the alewife, uh, just a much chunkier, bigger fish trout. Uh, bass are gonna just look bigger. Um, Carp certainly, if, if you you know if you if you see a fish that's two and a half feet long, it's not an alewife. They are uniformly you know 12, 13 inches. Uh, we get a lot of mistaken identities with bunker, the Atlantic herring. Uh, they they can be potentially confusing, but there's some differences. Alewives, as you saw in the earlier videos, are going to circle around each other mostly. They're not going to line up like this. Bunker line up like they're in a parade and swim together in tight formations. Uh, they're almost always at the surface bunker with their mouths open as they're feeding. 
um, and they're bigger. Bunker are you know, fifteen to twenty inches or so. They're they're, they're just much chunkier fish than uh, river herring. Again, this is a video of that Mill River site from above. You can see these are these fish are not lined up. They're not right at the surface, and they're not um, sort of facing one direction. They're milling about. That's that's that that's like that's why I tell people that's like that's how to describe what they do is they mill about. Um, you may not see fish sometimes, but if one sign, and this is often the first sign of the fish we get, is that the is scales on the shore because the raccoons and and the other predators find them before we do. So if you're early in the season, especially looking for river herring, uh, looking for scales and you might think, well, I'm not going to be able to see scales, but um, in in the early spring, before there's a lot of green things, a lot of brown uh, um, leaf litter, the scales do jump out at you. So something to look for. This is not a picture from Long Island. This is from up in Massachusetts. But these are the um, herring gulls that I mentioned lined up waiting for river herring. The birds are going to know they're there before we do. So if you see a bunch of herring and other gulls lined up on the shoreline somewhere. That's probably a good sign that river herring are moving in. And and these birds, osprey, uh, this is a black crown night heron, but yellow crown night herons as well. If you go to a stream and there's a bunch of birds perched looking down at the water, there's probably some river herring in, in the in the neighborhood. All right, that's all I had. Um, before we turn things over to Katie to talk you through how you can participate in the survey and how to submit data through our app, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so we had one uh, question earlier in the chat. Uh, do larger eels burrow in saltwater sand? And Byron answered, no, they may hug the bottom where they feed, but they're not known to burrow, ex sorry, except uh, in the winter when they might burrow in the mud when they're not feeding. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Enrico. Yeah, I just say that I know sometimes people get confused that there's eels in the bay and when they're supposed to be in fresh water. And that part of that is that they, you know, they don't always get to the fresh water they want to get to and they just settle in and they can, they can, they can survive mm -hmm. and, and persist in, in brackish conditions, certainly. Um, but yeah, and I would agree, they're not, they're not going to burrow into sand like some other species do, but they, they're they'll get under leaf litter and things like that. And they're mostly nocturnal, so during the daytime, if you're around a stream or a embayment or something, you can you can flush them out of their sort of daytime resting spots and see them scurry away from seemingly underground. But it's really just under the leaf litter. Enrico, um, the other thing, the there is some separation by the the sexes the females tend to go inland further than the males do mm -hmm. so you might find male eels in the estuary or out in the bay um and they do move about they're not stationary um, yep thanks byron okay thank you uh and that that question had been from julia thank you julia uh next we have from tracy can you do this from kayak yeah sure i mean i think you can get to some spots where you with a kayak where you can't get to with you know by why and there are there are sites on long island that like i can think of one like champlain's creek in islip where we don't know that there's a run there because it, it's surrounded by private land at the head of at the at the first barrier um and there's it's just hard to get to so there are yeah you can it might be hard to see them unless it's really clear if you're right on top of them like that, but um, sure, it's worth trying. Okay, great. Uh, next, we have a question from Alexis. Uh, Jimena, can you go ahead and repeat that question? Thank you. Yeah, um, Alexis is asking, and I know you covered this, but if you wouldn't mind repeating and I can translate, um, He's asking, what's the average size of the river herring and the American eels um, when they make this trek? Uh, the adult river herring are about 12 inches, almost almost uniformly. I mean, there'll be a couple, an inch or two smaller, bigger, but 12 inches long. 
Um, and the American eels are, they're tiny. They're like this, they're like uh, two or three, you know, two or three inches, I'd say. Um, Alexis, eh, los peces eh, adultos cuando vienen eh, hacia los ríos miden como 12 pulgadas este, y las anguilas son chiquititas porque son juveniles, así que son miden entre 2 y 3 eh, pulgadas de largo. Ah, ok, este, Jimena, muchas gracias por la, por la respuesta. Tengo otra pregunta. En casos donde no podamos recorrer el río, que no haya buen acceso, ¿se podrá usar un dron? Llevándolo ah. abajo, eh, que no sea, por decir, este que esté muy cerca del agua, se puede hacer un recorrido y visualizar si hay algún tipo de obstrucción. No sé, pienso que sería una buena idea también. Um, Alexis is asking that um, if there's a case where, um, if there were a case where there's no access or limited access to a river, whether using drones is an option to look at you know, the, the journey that way. I would say, yeah, if there's enough fish in, in, um, in the system and, and, it, and the lighting is good and the water's clear enough, I think, yeah, you could probably see them with a drone. Yep. I don't think there's probably not that many runs on Long Island that are large enough that you would see them, but I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's worth trying. Um, él dice que probablemente, probablemente sí, si sí, sí el recorrido, o sea, si sí hay suficientes peces, si sí, un eh, recorrido suficientemente numeroso, probablemente sí se pueda ver con un drone. Eh, pero también dice que al menos en Long Island, no, él no cree que haya eh, muchos recorridos que sean lo suficientemente grandes para eso. What about in uh, Westchester, Enrico? Do you know? I know he's calling from the Bronx, Westchester region. Yeah, I don't know those sites, but I it's a, it's a it's a great idea that I you know I have never heard anybody suggest it, but I you know there are again there's sites where you just can't get to because of private property, and uh, you know it's a it's a it's a great idea. Okay, I, uh, I would concur with that. I think there's a couple of larger, more substantial streams in Westchester County that may have limited access, where if you could fly up the stream to the base of the dam and look a little bit, uh, you might be able to spot them. Yep. Okay. Um, Alexi, eh, Byron dice que en Westchester él cree que hay, eh, posiblemente hay algunos ríos que tienen eh, recorridos lo suficientemente grandes donde funcionaría usar drones y mirar en la parte de abajo de las represas. Ah, sí, excelente. Sí, ahí también dijeron que, le, que no se les había ocurrido y que les pareció muy buena idea, así que gracias. Sí, yo, yo pienso que es una muy buena idea para hacer un como un sondeo completo y después ver, eh, analizando y viendo el camino por el dron, grabando un video, analizando el video, van a haber zonas que no van a poder ser este, recorridas y con un dron uno puede ver y crear estrategias para llegar en caso de que haya alguna obstrucción. Sí, sí. Yeah, he, he agrees this, this could be a, a good idea for cases where, lim, with, where there's limited access. Indeed. Um, okay, does anyone else have questions before we move forward? Yeah, I just had one question. Have you ever put sheet metal or whiteboard on the bottom in order to see? Uh, I, I have not done that myself. I have, it's a good idea. I've heard, heard of people, um, doing that in some other situations, but yeah, I think if you have access to do that somewhere, it would, would, would certainly help. We do that. We put some reflective materials in the camera boxes, right? But those are smaller finite areas to get enough material to put on the bottom, uh, cover stream bank to stream bank and hold it in position um, becomes a little bit of a log logistical nightmare because the current is going to move it. If you don't have it set right, um, <clears throat> you know, it's just not going to be effective. Um, it would help. You do want to look when you're looking for them. You want to look over the light colored bottom if there is any there or against some vegetation. So there's a contrast between the fish and the, the habitat around them. 
Um, I just don't know of anyone who has done that in in a stream that is not you know that's not associated with a fish ladder or a camera. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I I haven't heard of it either, but I, I think yeah, as Byron said, it's going to be challenging to keep it in place. But if you could you know <clears> set <throat> a little place where it was secure. And it would essentially just mimic like one of those vegetation beds, and, and mm -hmm. you would watch that. And the fish do move around as they're as they're milling about, and they you could swim over your light spot if there yeah. weren't any other light spots. It could, you know, it challenges, but it could work. Yeah. And, and I would just urge you not to leave it in the, you know, make sure you take it out after this season is over. Well, leaving it, putting something in place, and leaving it in most of our coastal streams, it's going to get matted with algae very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So it will lose its effectiveness. So it would have to be cleaned almost daily or, you know, at least a couple of times a week mm -hmm. uh, with the camera cameras in place. They have to clean them uh, almost every day. Yeah, good point. All right. Well, Enrico, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. Perfect amount of fish pictures. So <laughs> good call. Uh, and Byron, thank you so much for all of your knowledge, as always. Um, okay, so we can move on to the next portion of the webinar, uh, which is breaking down how to do data submission through this Survey123 app. Uh, so go ahead, Caitlin. Thank you. Okay. I will be sharing my screen. Where did that go? Okay, you should be seeing the CTUC homepage in about a second. Can somebody yep. please confirm? Okay. So um, there's a few different ways uh, that you could enter um, data into the Long Island um, River Herring and Eel Survey. So um, I'll go into each uh, method now, but the first one I'll go over is how to do it on your desktop. Um, this is if uh, you don't feel comfortable or you don't have access to doing it in the field and you collect all the information and you go home and want to enter it on your actual computer. So uh, this is the CTUC homepage. Uh, so I just typed in Google CTUC.org or just CTUC and you click pretty much the first link. This is what our homepage looks like. And in order to get to the survey page, you're going to go over to get involved. You're going to hover over that. And then this drop down will pop up for um, everything that's kind of on our website. And you're under community science projects. We're going to go all the way down to River Herring and American Eel Survey. So we're going to click on that. And this is the web page that we have for um, river herring and eel, the surveys. Um, this can be a great um, tool to use after this webinar. If there's anything that you want to go over or look at, we have a list of survey sites here based on region. And we have our protocol sheet here as well. These are all hyperlinks. Um, if I scroll down a little bit more, this is our training video from last year. But once this webinar that we're currently doing right now, once this is over and we edit it, at some point, this will be replaced by this year's webinar. Um, so if for whatever reason you need to go back and, and look back at the webinar, it'll be here at some point. Scrolling down a little bit more, this is where the survey is embedded into the actual website. So you could do it straight here on the website if you are doing this at home on your desktop. You could also access this on the uh, website on your mobile device, and I'll go over that in a few minutes. But here, so anything with the red asterisk, you want to make sure that that field is filled out. So if you don't, if you kind of skip over it or you forget to fill it in, uh, you will not be able to submit the survey. So you just have to make sure before you submit it, um, you fill everything out. And if you miss a box, it'll um, pretty much not let you submit the survey until you do so. So you gotta enter your name, your email address, stream or river that you surveyed. And this is a drop down option here. So all of the streams and rivers are in alphabetical order. So you kind of just uh, scroll down until you pick the stream or river that you surveyed. If for whatever reason uh, you can't find 
the stream that you surveyed all the way at the bottom, there's another option. So you could click on that and you could physically type in the stream that you surveyed. If I scroll down a little bit more, this is the GeoPoint um, option. So this just gives a more specific idea of the location that you surveyed. So um, most of the times, it's not doing it for me, but um, it'll, oh, there you go. So right now it's showing my current location. Um, so this is my computer. So if I'm going to be surveying, or if I'm filling this out for a survey that I did earlier in the day, I would just have to zoom out using the minus button and then go and find the stream that I surveyed. So let's just say I surveyed somewhere in Babylon, Argo Lake. Um, I would just click where I did the survey, or you could even enter an address or a location here, and it gives you coordinates as well on the bottom. Scrolling down a bit more, you just have to also enter the date and time that you did the survey. Uh, title stage is also important to note, and uh, I'll go over uh, the resources for local tides when I go over the um, mobile section. Um, and if you have a thermometer, you could do water temperature. That's always great to know, but not necessary. Um, and weather. And of course, whether or not river herring are present, yes or no, even if there are no river herring present, it's always important to get that data anyway. So if you are able to find river herring, uh, just give approximate of how many you see. And this goes the same for American eel. So were there any present? And if so, approximately how many? There's also a box here to uh, for you to write down if you observed any other species in the area. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so if you captured any herring gulls or ospreys in the area, but you don't see any fish, that's really important to mark down. Um, if you scroll down a little bit more, you can also um, install this photos. So you could either um, take photos, which that wouldn't apply to us right now because we're on our desktop computer. Or if you took photos earlier in the day when you were out surveying, you could upload them right here. And if there's anything else you wanna note, you could write so in the notes section. And then once you fill everything out and everything is the way that you like it, you could press the submit button right on this page and it'll upload the survey. Um, and Hi, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you resend that? I've had a real lot of trouble connecting. It's knocked me off. It says I have to register when I already did. It's some of it is my fault because I've closed the I've like gone to the screen on my phone. I'm only I couldn't do it on a tablet. I don't have a computer. I only have a cell phone or a tablet. So um could you resend that? I'm so or send it to my email. Uh, this is on our website, the SeaTuck website. Oh, SeaTuck. Wow, you're SeaTuck. I've been there before. Oh, all right. So what do I look for? Um, We could go over that more specifically in the breakout okay. section, if that's okay. 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 All right. So if, um, if you're on your desktop here and you want to access it on your mobile device, so you could actually uh, scan this QR code here uh, in your computer app. Or um, if you're unable to do so, you could click uh, this hyperlink here and under uh, the second option. So, and then scrolling down a bit more, it gives our um, past survey site map um, of all the different areas that we've surveyed in the past. This is for 2022, so we haven't had a chance to um, update for 2023 yet. Sure. And it also has, this website also has um, additional webinars or, or breakout sessions that you could watch from uh, past videos. So this is pretty much uh, everything that you can access on the desktop version. So I'm going to switch over to my phone. Okay. You should be able to see, hopefully, Okay. 
So this is the home screen of my phone. So pretty much I have an iPhone. So this I will be talking about this based on if you have an iPhone or not. Um, so to access the website, it would, you just go into your regular internet browser, whatever you use. This is what the website looks like on your mobile device. So pretty much the same as you saw on the desktop version. In order to get to the same website page, you would go to menu. And then under get involved, we will scroll down until we get to River Herring and American Eel Survey under the Community Science Projects section. And again, same website, just on the mobile device. So it's going to have the same information, it's the same webinars, the same hyperlinks. Um, but I'm going to show you, so you can enter the survey straight here on the mobile device like this. Um, it's the same survey that we just went over, or um, if you prefer, we could do it through the Survey123 app. So since I'm currently on my mobile device, I can't scan this QR code, but that's what this hyperlink is for. Under the second option, number two, uh, the blue text that says click here, I'm going to click on that. And it's going to give me two options, either open the, the survey in my browser or open it in the survey one, two, three field app. So I already have the field app um, downloaded from my app store. But just to show you quick, I'm going to open it in my browser to show you what it looks like in your in, it, in your internet browser if you don't have the app. Um, so, the, and it's going to look similar on the mobile device as well. It's the same options. So that's on the internet browser. And then if I go back, I want to do it in the Survey123 field app. So I will click on that because I already have the app downloaded on my phone. So this will pop up and I'm gonna click open the survey. Open. And why did that happen? All right. It's also important to note, you don't need an ArcGIS online account in order to access the survey. Uh, so we're gonna choose the third option that's listed here under continue without signing in. And um, I don't know why, usually it would just bring you right to uh, the, um, the actual survey instead of your main page. So I'm just gonna click on the survey. Okay. So this is what it looks like within the mobile app itself. So you fill out the same information, your name, email, everything with the red asterisk, like I said before, uh, needs to be filled out. Otherwise, the survey won't be uploaded. Um, same thing um, with the specific location. So since um, ideally you would have this app open while you're currently in the field at the site that you're um, surveying, you can click on the GeoPoint location. And if your location settings are accurate or on, then it'll bring you to where you currently are. So if I click the crosshairs button, it's showing my actual location. And you could, instead of looking for a location or putting in map coordinates, you can um, enter your information that way. So this, this is great if you're in the field and um, you, it's just easier to, to find exactly what area you're surveying. So once you find the area, uh, you click the check mark at the bottom right-hand corner, and, and that's pretty much it. It's kind of straightforward there. Um, I want to show you here the um, resources for local tides um, in order to help you answer these questions, whether it's a rising tide, falling tide, or slack tide. So I'm going to click the link here for resources for local tides. And because it's going to show, well, I already did this, but it's going to ask you to access your current location. So I already earlier clicked that option. I clicked yes. So now um, my phone is, um, my location is turned on. So this automatically populated the closest um tidal gauge that's near me. So the closest it's saying is um, Northport Bay. So I'm just going to select that option. 
And this is current. So this, this is right now. So um, our last low tide was at 3.31 p.m. And our next high tide is at 9.31 p.m. So if I went out at, let's just say, 4 p.m. earlier today, that would mean that I'm in a uh, um, rising tide because um, low tide already, la already passed and we are getting to high tide. Um, and if it was the opposite, if high tide was at 331 and low tide was at 931, then it would be opposite. It would be um, a falling tide because we already at high tide and now we're going to low tide. And if I went exactly at 3.31 p.m., that is when you use the slack tide option because that's exactly when tide is. And this goes for high tide and low tide. So if you're exactly at low tide or exactly at high tide, it's slack tide. And that's pretty much it. So you're going to fill out the same information here, like how I went over on the desktop version. And here at the bottom, you could also either, if you if you took photos already and you have them on your phone, you can click the folder button there and um, you could upload the photos directly. Or if you wanna take live photos, you click the camera option. And that is pretty much it. So once we have our survey, you could click the check, bot, uh, check button at the bottom right-hand corner. But since I didn't do that, it's gonna yell at me because I didn't fill out all the required um, sections. Um, so what I wanna do if uh, I wanna fill this out later on, I want to save this as a draft. So I'm gonna click the X button in the top left-hand corner, and it's gonna give me three prompts and I want to save in drafts. So I'm gonna click that option. And I already played around with this earlier, so it's showing that I have two drafts but let me go back. So this is my uh, main page for survey one, two, three. So it shows all the other surveys, all the other community science surveys um, that I participate in. Uh, and it's this is a great app to have in general if you are involved in multiple um, community science projects. Um, so you could see under the 2024 River Herring survey, I have two drafts. It's indicated by the yellow, um, the orange circle. So if I wanna go back, I just tap on that and then I'll tap on my drafts and just pick whatever one I was just in. Okay, and that is pretty much it. Um, those are several different ways on how to um, access survey one, two, three or fill out the survey for um, the River Herring um, survey. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Very, very informative. Um, before we go into our breakout groups, just a couple things. Um, so there was a question in the chat. We're gonna answer most of these questions when we go into breakout rooms, if you have any, any additional questions, but uh, Tracy was asking um, if ArcGIS login is necessary. Um, it is not necessary. Do you know why I may be prompting for that, Caitlin? It's been a while since I created an account. Um, it is not necessary to access. Um... I don't know why it, it asks you that, but it, it is, you can easily just bypass that option under, it's a third option. So it's continue without signing in. So that, that should not be a problem for anybody if they don't have an account. Um, but maybe reach out if you continue to have issues with that. I know you said you had to log off, Tracy. Um, and then quick before we go into our breakout groups, I'm dropping again in the chat. Um, we're having an in-person event. Um, all of our community science Long Island webinars this year have had an in-person uh, component uh, if the weather uh, cooperates with us. So uh, we will be meeting at the Woodhull, uh, the Byron Young Fish Passage at Woodhull Dam <laughs> uh, on March 23rd, and I'm dropping that form into the chat now so that you can um, go ahead and register if you like. That Once again, that's not required for participation in the survey. That's just for people that maybe need a little additional assistance and would like to um, check out that fish passage project uh, that's right there on the border of Riverhead and uh, Southampton. Um, 
All right. So thank there's you. one thing I want to add. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this. Um, so the survey that I just went over on the website and on the mobile device, this is specifically just for Long Island. There is a separate survey uh, for Westchester and um, in Queens. So that is that'll be sent out or that'll be put on the website um, at some point. All right. I just had a quick question, Valerie. I'm just curious if if um, attendees will have a chance to see Byron Young at the Byron Young Fishway on the in-person day. I believe so. Byron, you are muted if you wanted to uh, jump in there. Well, I'll just say if it's, it's a real treat. Anybody gets to make it out there that day to there's nobody knows more about these fish than Byron and he's uh he'll have a lot a lot it's fairly it'll be an informative and entertaining um visit absolutely looking forward to it uh and thank you all um so uh Ariel if you want to take over and break us up into those groups just for the sake of time thank you so much yeah of course quick um, quick, quick um yep. Enrico can you just remind us what time period we should be surveying yeah, that's, good. that's a good point, Sally. Thanks. Uh, the survey officially runs from March 15th to May 15th. Although with warming waters, it does seem like we're getting fish earlier and earlier. So if it stays warm and the water seems like it hits that right temperature, we sometimes could see fish even in um, late February. So, um, yeah. Yeah. 